Well, good morning. Is it good to be in God's house? Yes, it's so good. Um, excuse me while I raise this. The more birthdays you get, the closer things have to be to your eyes. Uh, but I was quite comforted this morning when Pastor Bobby told me that he, his back hurt from painting ceilings. And I thought, well, that's good. I, I feel it's not, yes, you're half my age. So I felt very, very good this morning. Yeah, God is good. It's so, uh, so good to be able to uh, share the word of the Lord with you this morning and to see uh, so many new faces and to see what the Lord is doing. And uh, <laughs> this is an answer to uh, my prayer. And uh, this is a different season of life for us. Uh, moving from being Moses for uh, almost 50 years to now being Aaron. And um, we're so glad to really to have that opportunity. Um, just absolutely delighted to see what the Lord is doing and to see uh, Pastor Bobby and Amber as they assume leadership here at the church. And this is the body of Jesus Christ. And... Um, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail about, uh, against it. And Paul said, uh, who is Paul? Who is Apollos? And who is Barnabas? One plants, one seeds, one waters, but God gives the increase. And so we're just so grateful to be part of what the Lord has done and also to be part of what the Lord will do in the future. Praise the Lord. Uh, I want to share with you this morning from Proverbs chapter 3 how to be good at life. How many are interested in that? How to be good at life? How many have ever felt sometimes that, excuse the language, but uh, I suck at life. Does anyone ever feel like that or just me every once in a while? Well, I want to share with you how to be good at life from the Word of God. Do you know that uh, Jesus has promised abundant life, but Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says this, that Paul the Apostle wrote that, that God's plan for your life is that you reign in life through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness through Jesus Christ. So uh, if you feel at times like life is riding you instead of the other way around, uh, God has a different plan for us. And would someone help me out? What Was that an Indian motorcycle hat the guy had on? Did anyone notice that? Anyone notice that other than myself? Yeah, I thought it was terrific. And uh, yeah, uh, just a little aside. So um, this is summertime. And for 35 years, we have vacationed near the ocean uh, as close as possible to it. And um, we have a, actually have a place in Florida uh, where we are and... Uh, the Lord blessed us with it. There's no, there's no road between us and the beach. And how about that? And so we, we, we just love that. But for 35 years, we vacationed near the ocean and um, we've tried to take two weeks at a time, one week with friends and family, then the next week just with family. And several years ago, when we started going to the Outer Banks, um, we had actually started in ministry of the Outer Banks. And then, and then um, several years later, uh, we had uh, our daughters and we were in a church. And so we gathered up some friends and we went to Duck, North Carolina. Anyone been in Duck, North Carolina? You know what I'm talking about. And so, I mean, it was just wonderful. The, the sand and the waves and the sun and, and all that. And I was catching tons of fish from the beach. And, and this one particular uh, day, I noticed that there was a sandbar that I'd never seen. And the sandbar was, I don't know, maybe 150 yards, 200 yards out. And there were people standing out there and they're scooping down and getting seashells. And so the next morning I came out and I decided that I was going to, um, I was going to swim out to the sandbar. And my wife was there with our little with our daughters and Jim and Marge Fox were there with their boys and, and, and everyone's having a great time. And I just decided to swim out to this sandbar. And I started swimming and I was a pretty good swimmer and I could swim long distances. And I'm swimming, swimming, swimming. And 
When I'm swimming, I like to just put my head in the water and paddle. I don't like to look up. I, I don't like water up my nose. Anyone know what I'm talking about? And just swim and swim and swim and swim and swim. And I swam for the longest time and I knew I was at the sandbar, so I touched my, I, I stopped swimming to touch bottom and there was no bottom there. And so I said, what is this? And I swam some more. I couldn't believe it. I said, how, how could I not? I underestimated this. I swam and swam and swam, and I'm getting tired. I said, surely this is the sandbar now, and there was no bottom there. And I went down as far as I took a big, deep breath, and I went down. How far is bottom? And I couldn't touch bottom. And panic started to set in because I'm tired and now I got a gulp of seawater, and I, I was exhausted. And I said, what? And, and so I went down, down, and I finally touched bottom. I come up, and I wave like this. And I was only from here to the sound booth. And I waved to my wife, and I said, help, help. And she laughed at me. because she knew that I was a strong swimmer, swimmer and I never just, I was teasing. That was all. I was not teasing. I was almost drowning. I was so exhausted. I just wanted to, to give up and get it over with. Maybe you've been in that situation. I've talked with people who have actually drowned and it just this feeling, just give up and go to the bottom. Fortunately, Jim, the veterinarian, saw me and he grabbed a little rubber raft and he paddled out to me and he rescued me. What had happened, I was caught in a riptide and I didn't even know what riptides were. Sun and sand and beach and ocean and sunrise, you know the drill, just wonderful wonderful, but it was a place of danger that I didn't even recognize because I didn't know how to read the waves. In Proverbs chapter 3 and throughout the book of Proverbs, wisdom, wisdom is personified as a woman. It's called she. She is the tree of life. Listen to my commandments. Listen to her. It's a Hebrew word that's sounds like hukmah. Would you say that with me this morning? Hukmah. Hukmah. Yeah, not hook me, but hukmah. It's a Hebrew word, and what it is, it's the wisdom of God that is in all of his creation and all of his acts with humanity. It's we're fearfully and wonderfully made according to the wisdom of God. It's everywhere we look if our eyes are open. In chapter 1, it says this, that wisdom calls to us from the streets. It's all around us. It's the wisdom of God. And it is available to anyone who will reach out to it and lay hold of it. It's just like the ocean it is as far as you can see. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. However, the scripture also says this, that if we choose to ignore the wisdom of God and not cooperate or comply with the wisdom of God that is for you and for me so that we can have what it, we can have this abundant life, it becomes a trap and a snare to us. It's sort of like, uh, spiders, and there's very few people that like spiders, but I've, how many have noticed the spider's web? And if you've ever gone camping or hiking in the woods, these giant wolf spiders, some of you might have seen those. There's this big web, and they can like fly across there. And one of the mysteries of life I still haven't figured out is how can a spider go from one tree to another tree and they're 30 feet apart and make a web. Can anyone tell me how they do that, right? But they can go across there, but an insect will come along and think, oh, I can do the same thing, and guess what? It's a trap to them. And the book of Proverbs paints this picture for us that the wisdom of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, if we cooperate with it, if we embrace it, if we lay hold of it, but if we say to ourselves, 
I don't have to do that. I'm going to do what I want to do. If we ignore it, we end up in a riptide in over our head where someone has to rescue us. And so I want to share some things with you this morning. In Proverbs chapter 3, there are several promises, if you would. We're going to look at just a few of them. And what happens, but all the promises that are here, all the statements also have a how. This is why, and this is how it works. Let's read verses 1 through 4. So, Lady Wisdom. Wisdom is a character or an attribute of God, by the way. So she says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of, her, of your heart so you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and man. So how does this work? Peace, favor, and a good reputation with God and man. And who wouldn't want that, by the way? Who wouldn't want that? Recently, we, we had a, a new neighbor move in and there was a, I, t I talked with him about just some, a few things, and I'll never forget what he said and what we both said. We want to be good neighbors in this. This is not worth going to war over it. We want to be good neighbors to each other. Good neighbors. Good neighbors. So how does it work? She says, don't forget my teaching. When we comply, when we cooperate, when we obey. There's long days and peace to our life. She instructs us to bind kindness around our, our neck. And truth, faithfulness and truth and love and mercy and kindness. And to write it on the tablets of our heart. How many, who, do you remember, do you recall any other place in Scripture where God said to His people to write things down and bind them to their foreheads. Anyone remembers that? So you can be blessed and your children will be blessed. And he said, tie them around your forearms and write them on your doorposts and then teach them diligently to your children. And wisdom, what happens? The peace of God attends our way. The peace of God and peace with God that settles over us. And we find favor with God and man because we're called to live not only to what we want to do, but we're called here to live in relationship with God and in relationship with our neighbor and our relationship with our community. Not everyone that we agree with, not everyone that we agree with, uh, is our neighbor. In fact, you might live in a neighborhood where there's plenty of diversity. And how many know you don't have to agree with everybody to, in order to show kindness? How many know that? Loyalty and faithfulness. You might, not, you might not believe the way that someone does, but if they can't help themselves, it's good to get groceries for them. If they can't shovel out their driveway, it's a good thing to shovel out their driveway. We just don't shovel out the driveways of people that go to church and are like us. God calls us in the book of Proverbs to have a good reputation with God, but also with people. And the peace of God attends our way. There was a song that years ago, and I grew up in church, and and um, I was somewhere around one week old when they tell me I was in church on the front row. You see, my dad was the pastor. My mom played the accordion. And so she was playing the accordion and I was bundled up. And then there, there was no nurseries in those days. There was, this was before children's church. There was Sunday school. You went to Sunday school, then you went to church. It's just the way it was. Thank God for children's church today. And... Um, 
but <clears throat> that's the way that that's the way that we grew up. And then when I started going to Sunday school, there was a song called a children's song, Jesus and Others and You. How many? Anyone remember that song? I'm not going to sing it this morning, but J is for Jesus because he has what? First place. O is for others. I think we meet day by day and Y is for you. And uh, in other words, you put Jesus first, others, and then you, and it spells joy. J-O-Y. The second thing that Proverbs 3 has to say, there's a promise, a principle of straight paths of healing and refreshment. Straight paths, healing, and refreshment. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In fact, would you read this with me? This is one of my life verses. Let's read this together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Praise God. Yes. Utilizing the wisdom of God, to me, is like going on a journey and using GPS. Remember, six, seven years ago, we went to Boston, which I'll confess right now, I just don't like driving in cities. I don't care if it's Boston. I don't care if it's Philadelphia. I don't care if it's Washington, D.C. And I don't care if it's Baltimore. I just don't like driving in cities. So we had to go to Boston. And on the way back, we took a detour in Massachusetts and we saw my Aunt Eileen, who was 100 years old at that time. And uh, that, that was a hoot. Um, she was stone deaf, and um, my mom was there, my dad was there, my brother Phil, his wife, and my, my nephew Tyler and his wife, and, and uh, she was deaf, and I get, somehow I got elected, because no one could get through. My mom was going, Eileen, Eileen, and Eileen is like, I mean, really deaf, like deaf like that wall. And so I had my... Aunt Eileen, and I'm getting louder and louder. <laughs> I said, it's Paul. And all of a sudden she says, little Paul, is that little Paul? Is that you? She hadn't seen me in 60 some years, right? And I said, yes. And you, Louise, your baby sister is here. Oh, Louise. And they both started crying. They hugged each other. And I mean, it was it was a trip. Listen, we're all headed there. So <laughs> we're all headed there. So we had to go through New York City on the way back. Now we had maps, and I've been in New York City, but I, I'll never forget on that weekend, it was as hot, it was a summer, and we're coming back through New York City on a Saturday afternoon. You talk about confusing. And I said to my, you know, I said, get the map out. I Listen, a map will do you no good in New York City. Thankfully, we had the, our, our uh, maps was on, and the traffic is so heavy. If you've ever been through there, there's layers of bridges. How, how many have been there? You know what I'm talking about. Yes, layers of bridges, and there's some bridges you, if you get in the wrong lane, you don't go over. I think the Verrazano Narrows Bridge right now is like a 20 or $25, but you have to have a token to go across. You don't, it, I mean, it's just totally confusing. And we get in the middle of this, and all of a sudden this calm, calm voice would say, in 250 feet, turn right. Guess what I did? I turned right. Okay, 
uh, in a half mile, get in the center lane, and then you're going to get in the left lane. Then you're going to go left. And somehow, we got through New York City. We did not get lost. And Bel Air was never a more welcome sight in my entire life. But it was a thing that I had to trust. I had to trust a satellite that saw where I was going and where I was headed, and not only where I was going, but the traffic conditions. The wisdom of God, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding. You see, friends, in life, when we lean to our own understanding, all we have is our memory, our experience, but no one knows the future and no one has the big picture, only God. But the beauty of it is, is that wisdom is available from the Lord for anyone who says, oh Lord, oh Lord, I trust in you. This is what happens when we trust in the Lord. I like to say that trust places us in God's quiet zone. The prophet said, in quietness and confidence will be your strength. When we trust in the Lord, I was 15 years old and um, I was with my buddies at a youth rally. And some of you know this name, Eber Reitzel was preaching, some, some of my New Jersey friends. He's a great, great man of God. And he gave an altar call about yield your, yielding your life for full-time service to the Lord. And I wasn't thinking in terms of for the ministry, but I'll never forget, it was like the Holy Spirit was talking directly to me, and I had all my friends, and, and I got up during that service, and I went up front, and, and I mean, they're pinching me, and they're kneeing me, and I had to go through the whole row. I didn't care. I trusted the Lord. It was good when I was 15. I went on then to Penn State, I was in a two-year forest science program. My life was mapped out. I was pretty excited about what I was going to do. God hadn't asked me to go in the ministry, and it just it wasn't even on the radar screen. And I remember on a Sunday night in church, my, the Lord said to me, Paul, I want you in the ministry. I want you in the ministry. I want you to be a leader and I trusted the Lord at that time. I never looked at what it meant to give up two years at Penn State. It wasn't that because wisdom calls out and it's so strong and it was good at that time. This, this past week, we, uh, we've been able to, to visit and some of, some of in the congregation, a longtime member, a founding member of the church, Maxine, that has had a, just, just not a, not a good, good situation. And um, um, so she has a really long road to recovery. And uh, so we, we visited her and listen to this, friends. We got to talking about heaven. And she said, Pastor, I don't know, really the truth of it is, I don't know if I'll ever go home again. But she said, I want to go to heaven. I, I'm telling you, this is where it gets real. This is where it gets real. I want to go to heaven. And we're talking about the Lord and we're praying with her because trusting in the Lord with our whole heart and not leaning to understanding is good, good for all phases of life. Chris and I are in this, this phase, I don't know, some call it retirement. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I don't see retirement in the Bible. Uh, although the priests, when they were 50, they, they, started, they took on another role. They really didn't retire. They, they stepped aside, and what the Scripture says, they were to assist the new priests coming up, but they weren't exempt from serving the Lord. But in this, this stage of retirement, people say, well, how are you doing? What's it feel like? I, I don't know. I've never been here. This is a new door. It's like opening a door and the lights aren't on. And then every day, doorway you go in, then another light goes on. But what I know, we're trusting the Lord. Is there an amen? We're trusting the Lord. We're trusting the Lord. We're trusting the Lord because the Lord says, trust him with all of your heart. 
Don't lean to our own understanding. And I've come to this place. Uh, someone says, do you feel old? I said, I don't know what feeling old has to do with it. All I know, I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to serve the Lord till something bigger than me takes me out. Amen. Praise God. And <laughs> that's what the Lord has for us. The author says in Proverbs 14, 26 and 27, in the fear of the Lord, there's strong confidence and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life by which one may avoid the snares of death. And then it brings healing to our bones and refreshment. There's peace in the valley. Praise his name. Healing to your bones and refreshment. Peace in the valley. The third thing I'd like to share with you is plenty and abundance. The good life is a life of plenty and abundance. It's not necessarily plenty and abundance of things, but it's of contentment and satisfaction and trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his, re his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. The scripture says there's a way unto man that seems right, but the end thereof are the paths of death, disappointment, destruction. Plenty and abundance. Wisdom the wisdom of God manifests itself as generosity because God gave most. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit had the author of this include generosity in this chapter. Honor the Lord with your substance. My mom told me a story recently. I didn't know. They, my mom and dad have been wonderful servants of the Lord. and You've heard me reference them. They're, she's going to be 93 in, at the end of August. <clears throat> she told me a story. And she said, Paul... Uh, she said, one day in the, in the state of Maine, that's where I grew up for the first 10 years of my life. She said, at the end of the potato harvest, you have to understand how important the potato harvest was. For two weeks in the fall, the schools of Maine would shut down so that everyone could be involved in the potato harvest. So I, we started picking potatoes, and I was, I was six years old. And what that meant was they got 18 cents a barrel, and it, the potato harvest would last four to five weeks, and she said I had, I had a little over $500. And what the potato harvest meant was that she could buy winter coats and clothes for her growing family, young family. My dad was a pastor. It was a, a different day of pastoring. Um, and uh, uh, smaller churches, and he worked as a carpenter. He worked cutting timber. He worked in the, in the farm fields. I remember there were people in church who worked in the local woolen mill, and they made under 50 cents an hour. So you could work all week long and make $20. Somehow they made it. So for my mom to have over $100 a week, that was, that was really big money. 
and she would buy heating oil to get us through the bitter cold winters in Maine. And she said, your dad came to me and he said, Louise, I believe the Lord wants me to start another church in Heartland, Maine. He started four churches while he continued to pastor the church in Exeter, Maine. And how it would work is that he would, there was Sunday school and then we, he would preach and then she'd pack a picnic lunch, she'd load up us kids and the accordion in the car and we'd go off to a preaching point and then we'd make it back to church that night. And we just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. We never felt put out when it came to the house of the Lord. We never felt that church was an imposition. And she said, my dad came to her and said, Louise, would you pray about what you've earned? Because I found a building in Heartland, Maine. It's $2,900. Would you pray about giving some of what you've earned to buy this building so that others could hear the gospel? Just hear me out. Because it's not about just you and me and what we want. And she said, Paul, I decided, I felt the Lord prompt me and I gave it all. I gave it all. And she said, and you all never went naked and you never went hungry. And I thought, well, that's obvious. I've never gone hungry. And she said, the Lord provided. Well, what I found out, that church in Heartland, Maine is in existence today. Many, 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 many people have come to the Lord. Many people have gone into ministry. The Lord has blessed that church. He's blessed the church in Milo, Maine. He's blessed the church in Dover, Foxcroft, Maine. He's blessed the church in Dexter. These are all churches that were started because they honored the Lord with their substance. When we honor the Lord, it becomes a generosity machine. It blesses people, it blesses the Lord, and it blesses us. I want to throw out a challenge to you today. Every week you hear Pastor Bobby say the tithe belongs to the Lord. I, I want to throw out a, a challenge to you today to acknowledge the Lord with the first fruits of what you earn. That's the tithe that belongs to the Lord. And the Lord will fill your life to full and overflowing because we can't outgive God. So my mom and dad, soon to be 93, the churches have reached many for the Lord. They are blessed. They have many, many friends. They're both serving the Lord. They have full barns. He drives a Mercedes Benz. They've experienced God's blessing, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, and their obedience and legacy have been, on, been passed on to many, many, many generations. God calls you and me to wisdom for in life as a long game. And when we trust in the Lord with all of our heart, he will never, never, never fail us. Wisdom manifests itself as discipline from our heavenly father because he loves you. Wisdom says don't reject or despise it because afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Sometimes where the Lord what the Lord asks us to do, we don't understand it. We don't understand it for the moment. But we do it because he's asked us to do it. Sometimes he brings some things into our life to discipline us. Paul wrote to Timothy, he likened us to soldiers, athletes, and farmers. Every one of them to be good, practice discipline and self-discipline. They don't become entangled in the things of this world so that they can please the one who has enlisted them. I want to encourage you today that if the Lord is asking you to do something and you don't understand it, just obey the Lord. If the Lord is bringing some type of discipline in your life, that's because he loves you. He cares enough. And it's okay. He makes our paths straight as a result of that. The final thing I want to share with you this morning is this. How blessed is the person who finds wisdom? Blessed. 
is the man, the person who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. For her profit is better than the profit of silver, and her gain better than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold her fast.